Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Forest Community Church Sunday service. My name is Adarin, and I have with me... Dan Taylor. Good morning. <laughs> I always catch you out with that. <laughs> well, welcome, Dan. It's so good to have you with me this morning. And thank you to everyone for joining us online. Uh, if you're joining us live, that's fantastic. And also, if you're joining us during the catch-up, that's brilliant. Don't forget, we do love it when you guys comment and interact. So please just feel free. And uh, we love to engage with you there. So how about that slideshow, Dan? What do you think? I mean, it was my own small group, so I think it was pretty great. But no, I really did like it. Um, in particular, I, I love the appearance of sushi. Obviously, I'm a big fan of that. But also, what really stood out to me this time was uh, Nigel, actually, and talking about railway preservation and the, and the Forest of Dean Railway, because I would never have thought of that, you know, if I was thinking, what do I enjoy? But as soon as you say it, it's like, yes, that's a cool thing. It, it, that's really cool. And so, you know, I wanted to give that a shout out. Oh, definitely. I thought it was really great to see there as well. And then there was a lot of Lego going on. You had Lego, the, the Vales had Lego, and a trip to Lego Land. That looked pretty awesome as well. Good. Maybe not the trip, but now's the time to build in Lego, I think. It's definitely the time. Lots of Lego kits happening. I know Jeff had a, a particular building kit that Pat gave him. She was hoping it would last a bit longer than the, the day or so it took him. <laughs> <laughs> buy bigger kits <laughs> however just going back to the sushi there uh dan i did note that john put that he enjoys buying rosy sushi i don't think that's entirely true john i feel that you partake of that sushi quite well <laughs> you have to ask john on that but i suspect you're right <laughs> i want to see what he has to say in the comments <laughs> start justifying yourself now <laughs> <laughs> okay so next week we would love for another small group to send their photos in about their passions and the things that they love doing and the small group is Aaron and Nat's small group so if you could get your photos to Lizzie by Wednesday I think it's Wednesday yes Wednesday at midday that's right and her email address is lizzie at fcchurch.co.uk and should be coming across the screen right now so thank you guys it'd be really great to see what you guys really love and enjoy doing absolutely yeah okay so now we're going to spend some time in prayer before the worship team lead us in a time of worship so lord god um these are tough times for a lot of people, I think. I'll just acknowledge that straight up. So thank you, God, that you are not a God who gives us kind of platitudes and nice sayings that make us feel better. And a, a God who's always vaguely looking out for us in a nice kind of way. But you are the real and living God. And uh, everything that happens is according to your will, we're told. Um, and in, in, in the big scheme of things. And it's hard to see how that can be true sometimes. But thank you, God, that in the end, you've got a plan. And thank you that you can bring good out of evil. And even in circumstances like what we have now, thank you that you are sovereign over the world. And that at the end of all of this, uh, we have our inheritance in you and we are invited into your presence uh, in confidence uh, in it, or we're able to come into your presence in confidence because of what you've done for us. And thank you that those promises that you've, those wonderful promises, they don't stand on how we feel they stand on our lives kind of being in a good bit but they're always true and in fact they're especially valuable to cling to in times like this so god thank you that you're so utterly faithful and utterly reliable amen mm, amen thank you dan so we're going to continue in worship but with sun worship with the worship team so rosie's going to lead us in christ alone thank you guys yeah
So thank you very much, Rosie, for leading us in worship. Uh, and now we're going to spend some time on everyone's favourite part of the service, the notices. Woo! Okay, <laughs> so, okay, first of all, I want to talk about spiritual support bubbles. I don't know what that noise was. So basically, um, we had a, quite a long interview last week speaking about this, and the very short version is uh, I've been finding it tough over the last few months uh, in my spiritual habits, and so this idea is to put some accountability back into it by pairing up and spending time with one other person and meeting every week to pray together and to encourage one another as we spend time with God and, and set each other goals or set ourselves goals. So um, if you're interested in signing up, I know I've said this before, but the place to go is email connect at FC Church, which I'm hoping will magically appear at the bottom of the screen at this moment. Uh, and if you want to find out any more, there is now a Facebook post up in the members group where I give a longer, more rambly explanation of everything that's going on and give some kind of advice if you're trying to work out how to make the most of it. So I'd encourage you, to, if you're interested, to go have a look at that. And uh, don't be shy, because the more people we get into this, uh, then I think the more value it will be able to, to give us. Uh, we've already got a few sign-ups, which is cool, but it would be nice to have uh, many, many people. So uh, you're all welcome. Oh, that's fantastic, Dan. I really encourage you as well, uh, guys, to sign up to that because I think, Dan, I think I really applaud your honesty uh, and coming forward because I've definitely felt like that. It's a very, it's an unknown season. No one has ever experienced this. It's very testing and it's been difficult and it can really, really pull on your faith and take you to dry places. So, uh, thank you for being honest and for putting this together to help people. And I'm really looking forward to these spiritual support bubbles. Mm. And then also something else that we've got coming up at the end of January is our Christianity Explore course. And it's a really, really wonderful course, guys. If you are new to faith or you haven't even, you know, started your journey of faith, but you've got all these questions then this is the place to come. This is a wonderful course, which is, you know, a very safe space with some great leaders who are very welcoming and open and honest. And you're going to be able to ask those questions and ha hopefully find some answers and actually start that journey of faith. Start. It's a Christianity explored. It is an exploration. It's a journey, guys. And this is a great place to start. So if you are interested in joining that, we've got several people already signed up. Just again, email connect at fcchurch.co.uk and we'll put you in touch with the leaders and they'll get together with you. And then they will start, um, they'll get a start date when you are all available. So, you know, just email that you're interested and they'll be in touch. But I really encourage you, if you've got those questions, start that journey. It's really, really is a great way. So that's it for our notices. Exciting. So that made it 10 times better, Dan. <laughs> so you're not saying, saying that we need to do that every single week and it will never get old at any point. Is that what you're saying, Darren? That's what I'm saying. But I think what I really want to see is I want to see Tim do it. Yes, I agree. No, that's the pinnacle. I think we'll have to work up to it. But if Tim does this, then I will feel that I will have peaked and I will have, like, beyond glorifying God and enjoying him forever, I will have fulfilled my purpose in life. See, we, we like to set these goals here. <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's exactly what I meant. Exactly. Uh, okay. So on to something just slightly more serious, but really, really great. We have Paige again with one of her wonderful interviews, and it is actually really, really interesting. She is interviewing Josh Harknett. No, that's not wrong. I <laughs> just I got my name, Richard Harknett. There we go. There's one for the blooper reel. Um, Richard Harknett about the Joshua Project. So take it away, Paige. Good morning, church. It's great to be back here with you today. This Sunday, we are interview Richard Harknett, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about something called the Joshua Project. So good morning, Richard. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, well, thank you. Yep, we're doing well. So could you tell us just briefly a little bit about yourself and what your connection is to the Joshua Project, please? So, uh, yeah, my name is Richard Harknett. Obviously, we've been supported by the church for a number of years now. Uh, initially, when we were overseas in Peru in the last three years since we've been back in the UK, um, I work part time for Echoes International and part time for Glow. Mm -hmm. And as a portion of my Glow time is spent helping to run and oversee the, the Joshua program. 
can you <clears throat> share with our church what is the Joshua program project what's it all about so the Joshua project was really designed for people who want to study uh, the Bible or theology or practical ministry but don't have the time to dedicate like a full year to studying at Tilsley. So it's a part-time program. Uh, it was designed to be studied either online or in person. Obviously, these days it's entirely online. Um, but that is essentially what it is. Um, biblical studies, theological studies, but for people who can't give full time to, to a course of uh, a course. Brilliant. So is it something that you have to commit to doing the whole thing or can you commit to doing just parts of it? Um, it's now designed on a modular basis. Okay. So people can sign up for modules, which are usually five sessions long. Fab. And so you say that these uh, modules are online. Are they, are they things that you can dip in and out of? Is the material online? Is it set um, with like a, a schedule that we have to follow? So there are two ways of studying the Joshua program. Okay. Uh, in Motherwell, there's a live um, session streamed every Tuesday night. Uh, yeah. And those like, are, are formed in blocks of five. So you would sign up for a module of five sessions. Uh, and if you want, I think there are five modules that run over the course of a year. Um, but there's no reason to make a commitment at the start to all of those. You can dip in and out of each module as your time allows. Um, and those are live streamed every Tuesday night mm -hmm. uh, for five weeks. The other way that Joshua runs uh, is individual churches or groups of churches in one area mm -hmm. can request uh, a specific course of study. Um, so they can choose what they would like to study and we'll deliver that um, to that church. Now that originally was done in person by a tutor traveling to the church to run an in-person class these days yeah. that again is is online um, but then that so that the course in motherwell is a preset course the tilsley college website will give more details of what, what's being yeah. taught so there's no qualifications required uh, as a kind of prerequisite for studying okay. but yeah people should be aware that the level that's being taught is broadly pitched at kind of a level okay equivalent Fair enough. Um, so that's the sort of level it's being taught at. Yeah. But there's no requirement to have any uh, um, qualifications ahead. Bro, but that's the kind of level that we could expect if we were to embark yes. on the course. Fab. Yeah. I mean, I personally would be really interested in something like this, but I'm not sure that I could necessarily commit to, say, every Tuesday for a you know stint of five weeks. Would I be able to access the materials for those five week sets after the event if I couldn't attend the live? Um, streams? Um, I don't think so, no. The live streams on a Tuesday night are a kind of fixed curriculum right and then the material is then made available through the, uh, the, uh, the online virtual learning system that Tilsley okay. College uses. Um, cool. That's really interesting and a wonderful resource in this time. And I think the, the degree of flexibility that you offer is quite useful in these times with people being busy and hopefully being back to work and whatnot. Um, yeah. I think that covers everything actually we need to know about the Joshua Project. I suppose the only question is, is how do people get involved if they want to? You, you know, mentioned the website there. Are all the details online? Yeah, so if you look for the Glow Europe website and then the Tilsley College page, and yeah. then you'll find the Joshua section uh, on there. Brilliant. Um, Fab. Um, and is there a fee for attending or taking part in the in the Joshua project? Yeah, the online Joshua run through Motherwell on Tuesday nights is forty five pounds per module. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you just pay that as each module comes. You don't have to pay like for a full year up front. Okay. Um, Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you very much for clearing up some questions and clarifying a few things. Appreciate your time again, uh, sharing with us this Joshua project. And hopefully we'll have a couple of people in our church signing up. So they may well be in touch. Like I say, feel free to write to me if you need to, more information. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time today, Richard. OK, thank you. Cheers. Well, thank you, Paige, for that great interview with Richard Harknett about the Joshua Project. It's really, really exciting to just have more information about that and to know where to start. And we as a church are really behind the Joshua Project. We've got some people who've already started it. 
So we do encourage you to have a look. And especially for those people who have actually moved through the gear courses that we do. So we have four stages. And the second stage is uh, discovering spiritual maturity. And we really feel that the Joshua Project will kind of seamlessly fit in after you've done that. It's not a prerequisite or anything like that. You don't have to do it. But as a church, we feel that's where you're at a really good place to learn some biblical truth, some real foundational knowledge to um, just really strengthen you as you continue your journey through the rest of the gears uh, with Forest Community Church. So Dan's got a little bit more information about how you access it. Uh, so basically, uh, apparently, uh, the Joshua Project is a whole thing um us based measuring how different countries uh how christian they are and it's like a statistical thing so this is a difference the joshua project and the key thing about this when you're trying to find it and get confused is this one is run by it's it's linked with tilsley college so this is where lizzie went uh, a couple of years ago to do her bible study so if we if you go into google and you type in the joshua project pro, the joshua project tilsley then that will take you to the right place. And uh, then you should be able to find the right website with all the right information on it. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dan. So um, we're going to move on to our children's slot now. And Sue is going to bring us a wonderful uh, children's story from the Bible with lovely pictures that Lizzie's put in there as well. So we do hope you enjoy this. And then after that, we are going to have some more worship with Rosie and the team moving into communion together. So you've got time now to go and get your things ready for communion and bring them to the screen so we can share communion together as a family. And then we'll have some prayer time as well. So thank you, Sue, and enjoy everyone. Heaven breaks through. About the same time Jesus was born, another baby was born. His name was John, and God had a special job for him. John was going to get everybody ready for Jesus. The day John was born, his dad knew God's promise to Abraham was coming true. God was sending the rescuer. So John grew up, and well, to tell you the truth, he was a bit unusual. He lived in the desert, and he wore itchy, scratchy outfits made of camel hair. He had a big, big, bushy beard and long, long, straggly hair. And here is the oddest thing of all. He only ate locusts, short for big, creepy, crunchy grasshoppers, which he dipped in honey to disguise the taste, probably. But God sent John to tell his people something important. Stop running away from God and run to him instead, John said. You need to be rescued. I have good news. The rescuer is coming. Make your hearts ready for him. Yes, get ready because your king is coming back for you. Great crowds listened to John. They were sorry that they had sinned <clears throat> and they wanted to stop running away from God. They wanted to be rescued. So John baptised them, which means he plunged them in and out of the water. It showed that they wanted to follow God and begin a new life. One day, John was baptising people in the Jordan River as usual when he looked up and saw a man walking down to the water's edge. God spoke quietly to John. This is the one. John's heart leapt. This was the moment he had been waiting for all his life. Look, John said, as Jesus came down into the water. But his voice came out as a whisper. He couldn't make it any louder. It was all he could do to even speak. The Lamb of God, God's best Lamb, who takes away the sin of the whole world. Will you baptise me too? Jesus asked. Who am I? John asked, to baptise you. It's what God wants me to do, Jesus said. 
So John baptised Jesus. Suddenly it was as if someone had drawn back curtains in a dark room, as if heaven itself had opened, because a beautiful light broke through the clouds and shone down onto Jesus, bathing him in gold. Beads of water glittered and sparkled like tiny diamonds in his hair. A white dove flew down and gently rested on Jesus, and a voice came down from heaven. It was clear and strong and loud so everybody could hear. This is my own son, and I love him. I am very pleased with him, God said. Listen to him. Heaven had broken through. The great rescue had begun. Dream hat.
Good morning. <laughs> Just before um, we go into uh, taking the bread and the wine, um, I think I think it would be good if we um, take a look back at the Passover and what it says in the Bible. So Pat's going to read it, take it from the Bible. <clears throat> good morning, I'm reading Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 14. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses, Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighbourhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs and internal organs must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night I will strike pa I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Thank you. So the, the Lord sent um, his angels of death over Egypt and that those who had blood on the tops or the sides of their door he passed over. What happened that night would be celebrated every year and it would be all passed down to from family to family over the years uh, and it was interesting that um, it, it talks about the first month and this is the first month of our year and it also says to be done on the 14th and um, it's nearly the 14th now so um, it just seems right that we should look at it. But then there was a turning point, I call it a turning point in history for all of us. And um, let Pat read about that from the Bible now, um, so that we get a bit more about it. So I'm reading from Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms a covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that's what's happened. That's what happened. <clears throat> so let us now, if you have it real, 
uh, let's break the bread as Jesus did on that night in that upper room. But remembering, um, he knew he was going to the cross and he would be paying for all our sins to give us eternal life with him. Now let's take the wine or juice as they did that night and remember the blood that he shed willingly for all of us. When we do this, it reminds us of God's covenant between him and his people. We all like to be told that we are loved by our wives, our husbands, and best of all, from our children. So as a child, of his, let us tell him that we love him. Let's pray. Father, as we um, take the bread and the wine, make it real to us what you went through and why you did it. You did it for us because you loved us as your child. Father, as your children, we just come to you now and say we love you and we put you first in our lives. Thank you for giving up your life on the cross for us. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here to come to you just as we are. Lord God, we know that you want to instill a deep-rooted, secure foundation of hope within us at this time. It's hope that we can hang on to. It's hope that is our anchor in the storm. And that hope has a name. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just pray that you would really help those of us that are struggling to sense and know that hope. It's not a feeling. It's a knowing, it's a choice. Isaiah 40 says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. There's a real purpose in being hopeful and it gives us strength. And we can share that with others. In Hosea chapter 2 verse 15, it says, God is the only one who can make the valley of trouble a door of hope. So at this time, Lord, when all about us is troubled, and there's plenty of struggle. May we see it as an opportunity to open the door of hope and let you in. Would you um, 
Would you just flood our hearts with that hope that we need today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy God, Abba Father, thank you for your provisions. We are blessed that we can go to the shops and buy what we need and also sometimes what we want. We pray for those today that are struggling and we pray that we will know when where the need is and that it, they won't be overlooked. Help us to see that and make us willing to help. Please show us the people who need a listening ear and give us wisdom to know what to say so that we can help with the right words. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the blessings in our lives. Even through such difficult times, you amaze us with your provisions. Thank you for our church and the leaders who have kept us connected. And we pray that the end of this pandemic is near so we can get back to some sort of normality. I pray for uh, the key workers. I want to pray from Isaiah 40. May they soar on wings like eagles. May they run and not grow weary. May they walk and not grow faint. Father, in this new season, we invite you to shape our souls with your words and inspire our lives through your works. Teach us to walk in the way of blessing to all around us. Amen. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why did your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people do, do not need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Whenever something exciting or dramatic happens in the world in which we live, uh, television, radio, the internet is full of eyewitness accounts of what has happened. They want to hear the story from people right at the centre of the activity, people that saw it with their own eyes, people that felt it, people that maybe smelt it people that were there. And of course, the Bible gives us a fantastic record of uh, the life of Jesus written by people that were there. And so, you know, I've got the, my Bible in front of me here and we look, uh, and so we're going to be spending uh, this, a lot of this year going through looking at eyewitness accounts of Jesus as seen through the eyes of Matthew. And so Matthew is uh, one of the first book, the first book in the New Testament and um, I thought we'd just, as a way of opening this up and starting us off this morning, I would ask three questions about this book of Matthew. You know, the first question, who actually was Matthew? Um, why did he write the book? And what was his response to what he saw? What was his personal response? You know, we hear correspondents, we hear, hear newspaper reporters and TV reporters relaying um, the official line. But actually, we don't know what their personal response often is to what they've seen and what they've heard. But Matthew gives us uh, some, you know, tells us what his response was. So it's really important because that's really helpful and persuasive. So why was Matthew written? Uh, well, sorry, who was Matthew? Well, Matthew was a tax collector and he was considered by his own people. He was Jewish, uh, a traitor, and almost certainly would have been quite unpopular because he was working for the Roman um, uh, nation and collecting taxes on their behalf. 
As a result of that, he would have been very wealthy and also he would have had a number of skills. He would have been great at uh, record keeping. He would have been there, if you were putting him in sort of categories, he would have been an administrative kind of person, highly organized. And he knew how to, to keep the records. So when people came to him, said, you haven't paid this. <laughs> this is what you owe. And he would have had a very good record of everything. He had another name. His name was uh, Levi. And so we read about uh, in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2 and in Luke 5, uh, where he's, talks, uh, he, he's called Levi. And either his name was changed uh, to Matthew by Jesus, or, or maybe he had uh, two names, like uh, often I've got two names, Timothy Cedric. Don't often use the Cedric uh, uh, name, but uh, you know, we, we, many of us have several names. And so uh, Matthew means gift of God. So maybe after he became a follower of Jesus, uh, he was given that, that name by Jesus, which is a really beautiful name. And of course, he became one of Jesus' 12 disciples. So he was right there. He saw the action as it unfolded before his eyes. And of course, he used these skills that he had in record keeping to write down a highly organized account, a systematic eyewitness account of Jesus' life. You know, in the book of Matthew, he records 20 specific miracles that Jesus did. He records uh, six major messages that Jesus gave, which gave the, the, the essence of Jesus' teaching. 60% of the book is focused on Jesus' teaching as a result. And then, of course, then he groups together in topical order, not chronological order, and miracles and, and the happenings around. So it's, not a, it's in a different order as the other Gospels, the other eyewitness accounts. You know, he groups together in chapters 8 and 9, 10 miracles. And um, you know, he follows his own pattern as he writes it down in, the, in, in, his, in his Gospel called Matthew. And... Interestingly, we don't read either in Matthew's Gospel or in any other of the New Testament words spoken by Matthew. Um, he doesn't, it's, it's, not, it's not there in the Gospels. But we do read a little bit about his encounter that he had with Jesus, which was transformational. And it's in um, Matthew chapter 9 and again in, in, in Mark 2 and Luke 5. And we had it read to us earlier on today. So a little bit about Matthew. But why did he write the book? Well, the book was written um, in the sort of uh, 50s and 60s, so about roughly 30 years after Jesus had died. And it was written, he targeted clearly the Christians who came from a Jewish background. And, you know, in the same way as each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were written by different personalities, um, conveying the essence, what they saw, um, to their readers, uh, but from their own background. And so Mark's gospel um, was focused, particularly thinking about with Roman readers in mind. And so unlike Matthew, he often explains Jewish customs uh, and so they can understand it because they, they're not Jewish. Luke uh, is thinking about the, the Greek audience and he's talking about Jesus, the perfect uh, son of man. John is perhaps a wider appeal. And so he's talking, you know, this, his main essence is this is the son of God. And so Matthew is very much thinking about people who come from a Jewish background. And so he shows who Jesus is and was, the Messiah. You know, he started right at the beginning of Matthew's gospel with the genealogy, which to most of us is a boring list of names. But if you're Jewish, you want to know, is this man really a Jew? Does he really descend um, uh, through the, king, the, the royal line where they knew the Messiah was going to come from? And so this was critical and vital for them to know. And of course, he traces them, Jesus' history right back to Abraham, who, of course, the, the children of Israel, were considered, the people of Israel were considered themselves uh, children of Abraham. And so he goes right back there. And of course, he then demonstrates how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. And so right in the beginning, in, ch in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, All this has occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, a virgin will conceive a, ch uh, a child and she will give birth to a son. And he's quoting there the uh, Old Testament uh, Isaiah, which the Jewish people would have been so well versed in. And of course, Matthew's gospel 
as you go through the whole book, 28 chapters, he quotes 129 times the Old Testament or gives allusions to the Old Testament. So it's full of references that Jewish audience would see and recognize and go, oh, that's the fulfillment. That's what that means. That's what that's looking forward to. And it would give authenticity to as to who Jesus was. Matthew is also the, as I mentioned earlier, the first book in the New Testament. And it, can't, it was placed there, I'm sure, because it forms a bridge from the Old Testament into the New. You see, there was this 400 year gap between the two Testaments where God appeared to be silent. And in the Old Testament, you read about how God was calling out a people, a people for himself, and he gave them the laws to obey. And then he promised that they would have a deliverer, they would have the Messiah. Then they had the 400 years of silence and then suddenly bang, right at the beginning of the New Testament, it starts with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who fulfilled the law. And so Matthew introduces him as uh, Jesus as the King. And often the book of Matthew is referred to as the Gospel of the King. You see, right at his birth, he was worshipped by kings. And later on in chapter 21, he came riding into Jerusalem like a king. But then also he introduces his readers to a new kingdom. You see, a, a new kingdom that's not restricted to human boundaries and barriers, not to uh, geographic boundaries, boundaries, not to the boundaries of race. And he describes this kingdom as the kingdom of heaven most of the time in there. And so he avoids using the name Yahweh or God, which was so sacred to Jewish people. And often they wouldn't utter that name. And other gospel writers who are writing to a different audience would refer to the kingdom of God. But not Matthew. Very rarely does he, does he use that phrase. He tends to talk about the kingdom of heaven. And he also, and critically here, he introduces a new people, the church. He is the only gospel writer that actually refers directly to the church. A, a word that, um, the meaning of the word church here Ecclesia um, is, is an assembly or a gathering or a congregation. You know, that's what church means. Nothing to do with buildings. You know, we, we, we didn't have any church buildings uh, until 300 years after Jesus uh, had gone back to heaven. Uh, it's only then that buildings were linked to churches. But a church is purely an assembly, a gathering or a congregation of people. And this was a church that uh, Matthew beautifully highlights is actually both for Jews and for Gentiles, non-Jews. And he underlines this by including um, the fact that in, in Jesus' genealogy in chapter 1, that some of those people in there were non-Jewish. Then right at Jesus' birth, non-Jews came to worship him. Wise men came from afar. They wouldn't, wouldn't have been Jews. The miracles that Jesus did weren't all exclusively for Jewish people. Sometimes he did miracles for non-Jews. We read about it in Matthew 8 and uh, Matthew um, 15. Jesus, uh, as he, in his teaching, he actually praised a woman who wasn't a Jew, the Queen of Sheba, for her, her faith. His parables indicate that Gentiles received blessings that were refused by the Jews, or by the nation of Israel in chapter 21, verse 40, 46. And of course, we don't know right at the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, when he commissioned the disciples to go and bring this gospel, this good news. Where did he say to go? To the Jews? No, he said to go into all nations, to all peoples. And so he's introducing a new people, the church. But then lastly, what was Matthew's response? You know, did it affect him? <laughs> I mean, he, he could have all this knowledge. He could have all this um, insight. He could see all these things happening around him. But did it really strike him and get him here? Did it make any difference to his life? Because I think if it didn't have any effect upon his life, why should I respond to it either? But if it does, then perhaps it tells us something important. And we read in Matthew chapter 9, and I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, and we read it earlier on, but I'll read it again. In verse 9, it says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. 
So Matthew got up and followed him. Just really simple. That's the introduction that Matthew gives of himself, nine chapters in. <laughs> Luke, when he records this very same story in Luke chapter 5 and verse 28, he says, he adds a very important thing. See, Matthew says that Matthew got up and followed got up and followed. He, he was sat there in his uh, tax collector's booth, collecting his taxes, doing his work, making himself rich. And he would have been watching Jesus, watching him from a distance. People would have been talking about him as they came. There would have been lots of conversation. Matthew would have been observing what was going on. And something was starting to resonate in his heart and his mind. And he was drawn in. And so when Jesus came by and said, Matthew, <laughs> follow me. You know, it sounds a bit random, but it wasn't just, I'm sure that wouldn't have been the first time that Matthew had seen Jesus. Matthew was like, yeah, that's the invitation I needed. I, I want to leave this life behind me, this rubbish life as a traitor, uh, working for a, a foreign um, nation who are imposing restrictions upon us and I want to live for something higher, something better, something greater, something more significant, something that will leave a legacy. And so he started to follow Jesus. He got up and he followed. Now Luke says, adds another element, he says this, he got up, he left everything and followed him. He got up, he left everything and followed him. You see, Jesus had a call upon his life. And so as a result of that, he left everything else behind and just followed Jesus. He was not going to be distracted by um, materialism. He wasn't going to be distracted by his reputation or lack of reputation or anything else. He was just going to go for it and give his best shot to following Jesus. And I just, as I close there, I want to say simply this, what about you? If you're watching this today, God has a call upon your life. He really does. And he's calling you. And he's calling you to follow him, just like he called Matthew. And just like Matthew, God is wanting you to respond by getting up, leaving everything and following him. And so a question for you really is simply this, is are you following God's call upon your life? Maybe you did years ago and you started to follow him and you sort of hit the buffers a bit and stopped. Maybe you got distracted, maybe you got stuck somewhere along the line. Maybe during this time of COVID and all the craziness which is going on around us, you kind of uh, just lost your way. Well, let me encourage you this morning just to come back and just say, Lord, I'm following you. <laughs> I'm putting aside all the craziness of this last year and Lord, I'm following you. I'm going to leave all that behind. Maybe you're a half-hearted follower of Jesus. You're kind of holding back because you're worried about your reputation. What happens if you share? Like Matthew, you know, he, he called a big gathering at his house, a banquet, and invited all his old friends to come and to meet Jesus. I mean, what would that look like for you? <laughs> a crazy idea. And what would it do to your reputation? You may be worried about that. But we've got to leave our reputation behind, haven't we? Perhaps there's secret habits that distract you, that you kind of like and you don't want to let them go. Perhaps it's the cost of time and finance that you're hanging on to, so you're more willing to invest in something which is temporary, we talked about this last week, than actually invest in something which will last, outlast you, the kingdom of God, and will have a legacy. So let me encourage you as I close to do two things. First of all, to pray. Thank God for his call upon your life and commit your life to following him like Matthew or recommit your life to following him. Ask him to forgive you for your hesitancy, for being perhaps distracted or for just plain sinfulness. And just say, Lord, I'm, I'm committing myself to you and I'm gonna leave those things behind. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to follow you from now on. Lord, help me to follow you. 
And God will hear that prayer and he'll respond to that prayer. And he'll empower you to live for him. Monday morning, Tuesday morning and so on. But then also let me encourage you to read Matthew's Gospel. You know, just getting, I hope that by opening this book up, I've given you lots of information this morning. It's just stirred something in your heart. And you're thinking, do you know what? I'd love to be able to see Jesus through the eyes of Matthew. Well, take that opportunity. It's only 28 chapters. They're really short. And just to maybe take a chapter a day and read through it. You'll start with the genealogy, which you'll find intriguing, um, and the birth of Jesus. But it builds on, takes you right through to the cross. Look at Jesus through the eyes of Matthew. And allow that yourself to be marinated in that and have your eyes opened perhaps to a different Jesus to the one you realize or thought he was and allow him by his spirit to work in your life as only he can so I hope you'll do that and join us as we follow through looking at other um, installments of how Matthew's life intersected with Jesus as we go through these next weeks let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have eyewitness accounts of real people who lived at the same time as Jesus, who wrote down detailed accounts of their, uh, what they saw in such orderly way. Thank you for Matthew. Thank you that even 2,000 years later we can read his account of his, his um, experience of Jesus. And Lord, we come to you today. Many of us, we just come and say, Lord, we've been distracted. Yeah, we maybe started to follow you years ago, but um, somewhere along the line, we've allowed other things to come across our path and to take us or our eyes off following you. Lord, we come back and we follow you. Lord, we, um, we want to leave those distractions behind. And Lord, we want to reaffirm our commitment to you today. Perhaps for some, they were even saying, Lord, for the very first time, I've committed my life to you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for the sinful things in my life. Lord, I want to I live by your power and your spirit from now on. And Lord, for each of us, help us just to get a fresh glimpse of Jesus, perhaps through the eyes of Matthew, as we read his account, available to us today in English. Lord, inspire us and encourage us and motivate us to want to love you and to serve you and to follow you more as each day of this year unfolds. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Rosie, for leading us in worship. And thank you very much to Tim for bringing us the message today. And my hope over the next few weeks is that we will be able to get deeper into the book of Matthew and especially Matthew's story. And in doing so, this can also bring us closer to Jesus, because in the end, uh, Matthew's gospel, it's not just a story. It's, it's a gospel of like the good news, which is what Jesus has done for us. So uh, the end goal of all of this should be to cl get close to Jesus as well. Absolutely, Dan. I really, really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the book of Matthew. I do like it when we as a church just dig deeper into a topic or a book. And this is the Matthew series now. So I'm excited. Yeah, um, I find it stays with you for a longer time, at least for me, when you do a whole section of one, like we did a, a, one on Romans in 2016 uh, at a different church and that's still in my head. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. And of course, we'll be covering Matthew as well in our small group. So don't forget, if you're not in a small group, please get into a small group. It is vital. They are lifelines, especially at this time when we're not meeting together in person. So if you'd like to be involved in a small group, please email Tim, tim at fcchurch.co.uk, and he can let you know which groups are available and what days they run and times. So we really encourage you to do that. We're just going to finish our um, service in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've shared together this morning, this time of worship, of fellowship, a time to learn more about you and a time to just honour you and praise you together, to share communion, to share in prayer and to just know that we are not alone. And we thank you for this. We praise you. We're excited, Lord, as we move into this new series of Matthew. We're excited to learn more about you, to learn more about your good news. And I pray that that good news will just be shared more with other people who do not know you. And for our Christianity Explore course, for people who are just starting that journey of faith, we pray for them. We pray that they will come with open hearts and minds that are ready to hear your word and hear the truth that you have for them, to walk in relationship with you. We thank you for those who have put their names forward for the spiritual support bubbles. And we just pray that you will honour that time, honour those relationships, that you will be there when they are gathered in your name and that you will share with them, that you will help them to grow in faith and that, that you will renew their strength and just be like this fresh water into a desert, into a dry place that just brings renewal and re, uh, regrowth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and pray for everyone this week as they go about their work from home or if they do have to travel to work, we ask for, for safety and protection. We just thank you, Lord Jesus, and um, we thank you for your church. We thank you for this beautiful gift that you've given us, and we ask you to help us to, to honour it and to share your good news with those around us in the community. Amen. Amen. So we've now reached the end of the service and I want to remind everyone that after church we are having our, is it coffee and chat we're calling it? I keep forgetting the name but we've got a Zoom link and some of us meet up after church and have a really nice chat. So if you're looking for an opportunity to say hello and, and meet some people then come along and have a chat with us. Yeah, and it's a really great space to just get to know us. If you're new to the church, you're welcome as well. You can just email us at connect and we will send you the link. But for those who are already members, it will be in the members group and has been sent by email already. I just want to add, in addition to that, the youth group, the bridge youth group that we run at Forest Community Church will be joining us <clears throat> in the coffee and chat room. And then we will be breaking out. So youth group will have their time in another room. And then everyone else who just wants to gather for regular after church coffee and chat will be in another room over here. So all in the same meeting, guys. So make sure you get that link and we'll see you at 11.45. See you later. See you Bye. later. Thanks for joining us today and you have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. Bye.